Queen here? Yeah. Then pawn takes knight. Oh. There is a common pattern. Now listen, if this pawn weren't here, now watch this, and we had this position. Let's say it was oh, like this. Wait, Mr. Shed, I see it. Then after moves like this, you see this? Uh -huh. Now if he takes, when this square is guarded, that's made. Yeah. Right? So that's a common mating pattern. Wait, I I that's what you want to look at. So let's go back to the... Steve, thank you for welcoming us to your chess fortress here at Masterman High School and granting us this interview. So, champions again, congratulations. Thank you. Okay, very good. With your busy schedule, have you had time to celebrate yet? <laughs> well, we've celebrated somewhat. Uh, we went out to dinner with the team and uh, had a nice, uh, nice time with that. Excellent. I'd like to spend time with you today to discuss and discover the secret methods you use in developing such successful, nationally talented chess programs here at Masterman High School. i also like to discuss with you the positive elements and effects chess has had on your student-athletes and regular students here at the high school. Can we do that? Certainly. Okay, go. But before we discuss those topics, can you give my audience a summary of your career in scholastic high school chess development here at Masterman and the United States in general. Would you repeat the question? I got distracted yes, when he walked in. <laughs> okay, no problem. Can, can you discuss with my audience and give us a summary of your career scholastic high school chess programs developed here at Masterman High School and elsewhere in the United States in general? Okay. Well, it's not just a high school. Masterman begins in fifth grade, so we have middle and junior high. Excellent. So we start with the 5th grade, we work up to the 12th grade. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess our first national championship was back in 91. And it was shortly before that, I guess about 90, that I st came to Massachusetts and started working with the kids. So the first kids we had, we started in 5th and 6th grade, and by the time they reached 8th grade, we, were, we won our first uh, junior high title. And then when those kids got up into high school, we also won there. So okay. it's getting kids started young. You have to get them started young and get them playing often. Uh, another thing is they have to play against tough competition. You want them to play against the best players that you can find for them. Uh, most kids' tournaments are played at a rather fast time control. They're playing other kids. They never get to play against adults and really, where, where they really take their time, think about their moves. And one of the things we found that works well is when kids get used to playing adults, they play in those slow time controls where they really have to analyze and calculate their moves. And it helps them develop stamina and also to perceive the way adult, strong adult players play their games. And they learn the strategy and the tactics and the ideas of those strong players. Another thing that helps is when you uh, get kids playing today, one of the big advantages is the databases. You now have databases of five million games that the kids can look at and analyze and see how the top players in the world play. Five million games of the best players in the world, when you have that at your disposal, that helps a lot. Then they also have access to very strong chess playing programs. And these programs will, one of them as you are familiar with, defeated the world champion, Gary Kasparov. So when you have strong chess playing programs such as that, that's also a big advantage. You, the kids can put their own ideas in and have the chess program analyze them and see how they did. So those, with those tools, it helps a lot. Plus, we were benefited by a former alumnus this year, Greg Shahadi, who came by and helped us work with the kids as well. So we had that advantage. And we needed those advantages because the competition has become so much stronger over the years. When I first played in the first national, took the kids to the first national championship in 1977, uh, there were only about 90 some kids in the elementary and a little over 100, 120, 130 in the junior high national title. They were played in, in rooms that were next to each other. In this year's uh, Super National, we had 50, over 5,300 kids playing in the elementary, junior high, and high school together. So that's a huge growth. The, the elementary had about 2,000. The junior high had about 1,500 kids in it uh, alone. So that's, that's a tremendous growth in it, and it's a lot 
more uh, competitive than it ever was before. So that those things have made winning national titles a lot more difficult. So all of this sort of comes together, and each year we've had to work harder to get better at it. The other thing that advantage that I had this year, I managed to find get a lot of kids that already knew how to play some chess. These kids, getting motivated kids that are bright and know how to play and are and and have some background is a very important part of it. I didn't have to take any of these kids and start them from scratch. They already had some background, already knew a good bit about chess, and they were motivated and turned on. And that's important too to get kids that are highly motivated and want to win. And, that, and they did. And, and then the parents' support. Getting a strong support of your parents is also very important. We, we had that. The parents were all there at the tournament. They made sure the kids got fed. There's a lot of energy expended at a tournament. Each game can last up to four hours. And our top player, Alex, he played three games on Saturday. Each one lasts about four hours. So you got 12 hours of chess with only an hour between rounds. And you've got to, and when you have the big crowds we had there, you've got to stand in line and wait for the line to, and, and for restaurants and wait to get fed. There's barely enough time. We had parents and I were standing in line before the kids were done playing, waiting to get a seat at a table and then order, hoping that by the time the food came out, they were ready, they were done their games ready to eat. So that's the kind of organization of planning that it took. And and with that, and it seems as daunting, what type of resilience do your kids build up and that they develop in this tournament circuit? There's a lot of resilience because, as, you, as you're well aware of, for everyone that, that wins, you may have 10 or 20 that work just as hard that did win. So there's a tremendous amount of, uh, there's a tremendous letdown if you lose, and that's very difficult. Young kids have a hard time, but as you get older, you mature and you learn that, that losing is a part of winning. You can't be at the very best and win without taking your lumps. Kids starting out, uh, you value something more if you put more effort into it. So if you just go into a tournament and you just play it casually, you, it's not going to mean as much to you. You're not going to be hurt as much as if you lose, but it's not going to be as exciting if you win. When you go and you work really hard to, to win and you put all your effort into it and you study a lot of chess and you play in a lot of tournaments and you travel a lot and put a lot of weekends into it, you putting a lot of yourself into it, that increases the value to you of that tournament and winning that tournament. Okay, question. Can you, in your estimation, tell us how chess has helped your students develop real qualities that require self-confidence, self-responsibility, imagination, and other intangibles that they're going to need later on in life. Well, chess to me parallels a lot some other topics. They say that chess and music and chess and math are closely paralleled. Uh, in math, when you get the higher math and calculus, you use both the critical analysis of the scientific method, but also you use some creative forms. For example, in calculus, there are set formulas that you use to solve problems. So you have to go to work those in. But you may have to take a situation and then you have to bring into it creatively and develop into one of those calculus problems. And you may have to use some algebra and apply that in creative ways in order to turn a situation into a solvable calculus problem. And the same is true in, uh, in, in chess because you may have certain techniques and certain analysis that you know and that you can apply in different situations, but you may not have that position quite on the board, so you attempt to take the position you have and find creative ways of changing it into one that you have that has a solvable technique that you're familiar with. So you have the calculation and you have the build-up of knowledge on how to solve different positions, but also you have to use that creativity and how you can take what you have over the board and change it into one of those. So the two blend together in a way that's similar to music as, as well, where you have structure, but you also have creativity. So chess lens works on both sides of the brain. Okay, excellent. Um, can you expound on the point of how these interactions that these your, your kids run into learning chess and playing chess 
on a daily and yearly basis, help them in their life lessons in terms of just normal activities and in, well, in, 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 in just surviving the rigors of I think everyday the, life. I think the biggest advantage is, as I, was, as I was saying before, and that how important the win is when you put a lot of effort into something, right. you learn that the, your success has a high correlation with your effort. If you don't put a lot of effort in something, you're not going to do as well. That that applies, that that applies to your school work. If you put a casual amount of work in, you don't put as much effort, you won't do as well. But it applies to going for a job. If you prepare for a job and you put more effort into it, it compare, you could use it in your in your social life afterwards and problems that you have with the marriage, with kids, uh, with a boss at your job. The more effort you put in, the more likely it is to be successful. If you take something very casually, you don't work at it, it's not as likely to be successful. But also, it's picking yourself up. Let's suppose you, in chess, obviously you're not going to be successful every time. You're going to work very hard and someone else is going to work just as hard. And they may be successful and you may not be. How do you handle that disappointment? Do you, do you give up on it or do you pick yourself up and come back and try again? In a tournament, you could have a very tough loss that you expected. And, the, and it could be a crucial game. But then you may be able, if you can come back and maybe get into the next game without being devastated by it. I've seen kids that have done very well on Friday and Saturday and they're undefeated and they think they're going to go all the way. And then all of a sudden they have a tough time getting to sleep. They're all excited Saturday night. They get up Sunday morning. They're tired. They lose. And right away they become demoralized and they lose again. Other kids are able to pick themselves up, dust all, themselves off and come back and come back strong and maybe win the last game and still salvage a respectable uh, score in the tournament. This is certainly applies to uh, lots of things that you do in life where maybe the first time you try, whether it's another sport, another activity, uh, you, maybe you get your baseball pitcher and you get shelled in one inning, then you don't give up, you come back and you pitch hard, you come back the next inning and then your team brings you back again. So you're able to win with it. Maybe it's a, in a high school or college course where you start off, you fail the first test rather to give up on it. You come back, you study hard, you know that you can pull it back again. So that that ability has a lot. And the fact that you can come back then increases your self-confidence. Initially, when a player is playing somebody stronger, he may be intimidated. He's not. He thinks, oh, I can't beat this player. Sooner or later, he's going to beat him. He will beat somebody higher rated. Then the question is, can I do it, but when will I do it the next time? And that's, that's important, too. And that ap applies to other things. You don't get intimidated by a class, a teacher, a test, other students in the class. You know that you get that self-confidence. comes in. You know that you can do, survive and do well as, as well as they can. Um, and, and thank you for that. That was excellent. I, myself, being a chess player and have known you for many, many years and watched your students succeed over the years in tournaments, um, here in Philadelphia locally and also nationally and very proud that um, that you have worked with this program and it is to the point where it is now 10 championships is just absolutely outstanding and I know you for a fact as being a modest guy so it's it's, it's really great to see you doing well but to your point about kids um, overcoming adversity and using chess as a game model to do that, you really feel that chess, and I'm sure you've seen it over the years, how chess has helped develop your students even beyond the board in life where they can handle adversity through using the game of chess. I think it's really hard to, to look down the line three or four or five years and to establish a one-to-one -one correlation with that and things that happened in their life some years in, uh, in the past. But, it, but in the short term, I definitely see kids with with self-confidence and not just here I've seen kids in other schools that maybe don't have as much going for them as, as some of our kids who have done well in chess and I and that difference in that self-confidence also the kids get to meet a lot of other kids from other cities and, and other schools that are very strong and you see a certain camaraderie developed among strong chess players and they get to know each other they get to be close friends and with other kids, and, and that expands their horizon and their social context. So there's there's lots of little ways, and to know to be able to establish direct cause and effect in any one area is is always problematic to to do that. But overall, you see that there is a correlation with kids having success, 
at playing chess and just winning at chess and becoming good at it. So you think it, it's got to have some rub off in some ways. Okay, excellent. Why have you been so resilient in this competitive area nationally? And what do you owe that formula to with your students? I see a lot of books behind you, and I know there's a lot of study and a lot of effort. But what do you think um, is the real um, cornerstone or foundation of your success here? I think probably the biggest thing is time put in more than knowledge itself. Now, there are some... There are some uh, players who've reached a level where we just need, they need to learn some things actually more advanced than, than I could teach them, and we have chess books for that, and I say I have another student that's helping me out this year, and in the past I've had some other very strong students, alumni, that have come back and helped work with it, so there are some students that were able to push up to a higher level because of either the chess programs that I mentioned before, or the chess books that I have, or the databases, or the assistance of other, some alumni. And so they're able to take my best students and move them up to a level where that enables them to do well and be competitive. But there's also another factor, and that is for most of the kids coming up, I think it's just the amount, putting in enough time at work. When you take them to tournaments, um, and you get them playing in enough tournaments, and you put that time in. There are some kids in other schools that never get to play in tournaments on the weekend. Uh, on weekends. Maybe their parents don't take them or the teachers don't take them, but ha that's an important factor, taking kids to tournaments and putting the time in and letting them play. And I think when you have a team effort, when you're taking teams, it makes it easier for the kids to do it. Kids want to do things that their friends are doing. So there's not that many chess players proportionally to say uh, basketball, football, soccer, the other sports. So you may have one or two chess players in a school that play and by themselves, they may lose interest or it's harder to continue interest unless you've got your friends at your age group that are also playing it. Let me ask you this question. How has technology helped you and your assistants in teaching your students here well, chess? And can you tell us about any educational or social side effects in using a particular training method for developing your younger kids? All right. Yeah, I want to get to that, but, but I want to f f finish answering, answering your last question. Okay, very too. good. And that is... When, when you take the kids to a tournament and you bring other kids into it, you're then creating new chess players that support the one or two that may know how to play. So then you open up a chess program, you get four or five other kids that wouldn't play otherwise, and then if you have two or three that are pretty good, they now have a support system of their friends that are playing, which enables them to want to go. And not every school has that. If a school's not taking, if a school has one or two chess players, but they're not opening up a program or bringing other kids in, and then taking them to tournaments, they won't get the development of the other players, which means that the one or two good players won't have the support system, then they will taper off in their play. There's so no continuation. It, that's, it, why, that's why a lot of work. That's why the time you put in, except for your best players, okay. just the time you put in to take kids to tournaments actually is one of the major factors for developing a school-wide program. Okay, okay, very good. And technology? Technology, well again, I mentioned earlier about the database. You have, you've got computers with that you could put five, up to five million games, or a little over five million now, of the top games of the top players in the world. And any player can sit down and go through that database and look up games. They can put their own game in and, and put the moves of their own game in and the computer will tell them Let's say after so many moves, maybe they put the first eight or nine moves in, the computer will then tell them how many games are in that database that have that exact position in it. Maybe there's over 200 games that have that. The computer will also tell them what was the next move played in that position in all of those games, listing those moves in order of the frequency they were played. So maybe they put in the first 12 moves of their game. Maybe there's over 200 move games in that database that have that position that their game, that they're entering, has. And then the computer may list all of the game. Maybe there's 12 different moves that were played at that spot. And the computer will list them and order their frequency. They can look at their own move and see how it matches with the move played by the Grandmasters and International Masters. Maybe they have a move that wasn't played by any of them. 
you can then put a strong chess playing program in there. They can then put their moves into that program, and that program will then tell them what happens if their move is played. That's a lot of input. Plus, yeah. you've got some great tactics programs that will keep track of your tactics, and if you miss certain tactics, it'll give you more problems with just those. And there's two kinds of tactics. One is where you have to analyze very deeply and long, hard, calculated problems, and there's a program called Chess.Tempo that does that. And there's another called Emerald, which gives you uh, very common uh, positions that you should know. Uh, common pat it looks for patterns, certain patterns you need to know. So you can learn those, both of those, by playing on these. So these kind of re almost replace books now in a lot of cases. Excellent. There's another factor that's kind of important too. In the scientific method, you look at you look at some data and you form a hypothesis and then you test that hypothesis and if it works you accept it if it doesn't then you try something else well if you think about it in chess every single move is a mini hypothesis in your mind you're saying well if I play this what will he do or my opponent what will he or she do and then what will be my response and you go through a series of moves and in your mind you're playing that out the way you think it might develop and then you're deforming a hypothesis, does it work or does it? If it doesn't, you'll try something else. And this is, extends in a chess tournament in many areas. For example, you try to look ahead and see if I win this game, I'm going to be paired against other players that won, which ones are likely to win? If so-and-so wins, I'm going to have to play him. What will I respond? What will I play him? What lines will I choose? If someone else plays? So you're constantly doing this if-then kind of thing, which is a very important in logical thinking and in coming up with alternatives. In life you have to think ahead. Suppose that you try something out and it doesn't work out. You have to try something else. You have to be able to come back and come up with a different plan. So the idea in chess is where you're constantly evaluating based on individual moves, based on uh, game results, on whether I win or draw or lose, what will the next option be, even to the point of view of if I don't do well in this tournament, do I need should I come back and play in another tournament to get myself ready to end on a positive note? So there's this constant evaluation of what you're doing and what might happen and then what you need to do to compensate for that all along the way. And you see the same you see that same thing in other areas of life too, where you have to think ahead. You have to use some logic and think, well, geez, if this then what? I often think we don't do enough of that in some of our other classes. In history, once in a while I've seen things in history where they say, well, what if? And they'll change some dramatic event in history. They'll say, what if this didn't happen? What would have been the results? And then, then you need to start thinking ahead. What would be those results? If Kennedy hadn't been assassinated, or, or Dr. Martin Luther King, or if Germany hadn't declared war in the United States, or if they hadn't invaded uh, the Soviet Union. You have all these possibility scenarios and one little scenario can make a huge difference and and in history I often think we don't do enough about prepping our students to think about these what ifs if this doesn't work out what else are you going to do history represents a great opportunity to do that and it, because in chess kids are doing that all the time they're always looking at these different results and what if I do well here or if I don't do well. Can that. you explain that and expand on it? Um, there's always been a question as to whether chess can really heighten the intellectual levels of children of any age. You, from younger age you have some children who are five years old that just understands the game beautifully as um, savants, uh, as in violinists or pianists. They're five, seven years old and they play a beautiful tone. You, do you see the same in chess? In yes. I, I don't think that... I have a different opinion from some with savants. I really don't think that people are born with an ability to do something. I think they develop it because they get very interested, made to the point of, of obsession, if you will, at a very young age so that they practice it a lot. And I think that constant exposure to something uh, teaches us. Uh, the Swiss psychologist Jean Piaget said that children reach the stage of formal operations about the age of 11 or 12, that prior to that they can't deduce from abstractions. They can only deduce from concrete operations from about the age of 9 or 10 on. But once they had 11 or 12, they're able to make abstract deductions or deductions based on abstractions. And yet, 
in language, they're really doing that from a very young age. And when and American psychologists have often said that the, those ages aren't engraved in stone, that you can, if you give the kids enough exposure to uh, a certain logical thinking patterns or, or logical position, logical thinking uh, uh, experiments or exercises, uh, they will develop that at an earlier age. A lot of European psychologists disagreed with that. But then the question is, well, how come young children can develop language where they can abstract in language, make deductions linguistically that uh, at a younger age? And the answer to that was, well, they get exposed to language at so much at, at a very young age that they learn those things. Well, if that's true, then exposure to anything at a young age is going to help the mind develop that. And in chess, you are being exposed to logical thinking. You're being exposed to what if I make this move, what's he going to do, and then what will I do with that? You're going to do all these hypotheticals uh, over and over again, maybe hundreds of times in each game you play. So you're going to get a massive exposure to this logical mini-scientific method, if you will, that would far exceed anything that was done by giving the child a logic problem, let's say, in the classroom. Here you're giving him hundreds of logic problems in the course of a single game. So that gives uh, increase the rate of exposure that young kids will have in logical thinking dramatically. So I can't help but think that that isn't going to have a positive effect on the kid's own development of logical thinking in, in his mind. Okay, thank you for that. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, we're here at Masterman High School with Master instruct, Chess Instructor Steve Schutt, uh, who has won up to 10 national championships here for the high school. Um, Mr. Shutt, I have a question to ask you. It's been said that playing chess is primarily a series of solving puzzles, move after move, where you have to take your time and solve each puzzle move by move and discover and find what the best move is. Do you agree with that, or is chess something more than that? Well, that's certainly a very big part of it. Uh, there, are, there is also a technique where you uh, have learned things and you need to try to figure out how to apply them. So there's partly is just pure analytical and calculation, but there's also part of it is based on knowledge, which comes from research when you're looking at ideas of others. Then, you, then there's a process of research that goes into it where you studying what others have done and then you're trying to generalize and pull out of that and extrapolate what others have done and then you apply that to your own style and technique. There, some players are, are attacking players. They like unclear positions where they have to mix it up and attack and uh, they, they enjoy playing very complicated positions where there's lots of variables and lots of ideas floating around and lots of different things they can use. And then others like to simplify it to where there's it's more a matter of technique that they have to work into developing it into a slow positional grind, if you will, where you uh, build on an idea or a theme or a strategic theme and then you just gradually work that and improve on it prove on it until eventually you break through with a winning idea. Do you have students on both sides? Oh yeah, you, you have students on both sides. And you tend to find that some players will have preference on some other, and others will have a, uh, have different uh, approaches or feelings. Some players like to get into a real slugfest and mix it up in the beginning. Others like to grind it out and win it in the end game with just a few pieces on. And in both cases rely on not only what you can calculate over the board, but you're usually not entirely in an unclear position. Often you have ideas that you've used from other games and where you see some similarities in the position or things you've studied before that you bring into play. So you're bringing a combination of knowledge into it, your own ideas and modifications on, the, on that to develop your own technique. Plus, sometimes you're just in this really unclear position where it just takes raw calculation to do it. So you've got all these different things that some kids are better at some, others are better at other parts of it. You notice that as the kids get better, these tend to merge. The kids have to be good in all areas of it to really reach the highest levels. So let me ask you this. What surprises over the years have you seen uh, face as a chess teacher um, with highly talented students? What um, surprises have you seen in their development or just in your experiences? Well, one of the one of the things that you it's hard to 
ge generalize when, when kids are starting out on, on what aptitudes they will use. I've known kids that they don't want to listen to you talk about theory. They don't want to listen to discussions of strategy and technique. They just love to play. They just want to sit down and play. And they, everything becomes a chess problem that they want to play and solve for themselves. Other kids really like to study and they'll do a lot of research. And some kids are more comfortable if they, they like to know that they've done a lot of pre-game preparation. If they've really prepared themselves and, and thought a lot about their opponent, what their opponent likes to play, and what his technique is, and develop their own technique, and develop their own ideas, and they've refined that, and they've done a lot of study, they then are more comfortable. And the obvious question is, who performs better, you it, know, the it, audience? That there's no one way that's proven better than another. Some players that, and, and that's true at the, at the level of the top players in the world. Players like Kevin Blank can play these very refined techniques where a player like Alakine loved to get in there and mix it up in these unclear positions. Lasker could play both styles. Steinitz definitely liked to grind it down and, and into a very simplified, clear positions with a definite strategy, with definite ideas. And so players vary a lot with that. And the same is true with players that I've seen. Some of them just love to get in there and, and get into this big tactical dogfight. And others like to go in there and really grind it down with this strategic theme, follow this theme and work it down and into a simplified position where they have an advantage and just work that advantage into a winning endgame. It's hard to predict whether one is better than another. Sometimes the kids that, uh, that seem to have the shortest attention span, I've had teachers come up to me and say, how does this kid play chess? How does he sit there? He just saves us so much energy, I can't get him to sit still in the classroom, and yet he'll sit there for hours. But he just loves that competitive competition. Some kids just love to be in that competitive nature. They don't, they're not as interested in studying. They don't want to hear someone else talk about it. They just want to get in there and dive in and do it themselves. Some of those kids can become very, those types of players become very, often are very creative players. And they love, they love the competition, they love the excitement of it, the tension of it, and they can become ex extremely creative. But you may not ex see that in them in a classroom where they're listening to someone give them a lecture and going on about certain ideas or certain facts. That may be their weakest point, but yet in a problem-solving mode, they're right up there. So you see chess as a magic where the kid's really inner self can actually come out where it wouldn't show itself in other normal, quote-unquote, yeah, classroom of, settings. With a lot of kids, that is that is definitely true. But there are other kids, too, that, that are really into the study of it, that will sit there and love... The study they want to, they don't want to go into a game where it's not clear. They want to maximize their advantages. They want to learn as much as they can about the ideas that they use, the, the, the variations that they play, what their opponent might be playing against them. So you see both worlds. And the better kids get, the more you see them merging. The more you see the kids that have that creative, competitive drive and study, because that the very best players have to be good at all of that. Okay, excellent. So again, we're here with renowned chess instructor Steve Shunt here at the Masterman High School located here in Philadelphia. A question, can you finish this statement for us? Teaching chess comes down to old-fashioned dot, dot, dot. Old-fashioned? Well, the, the biggest correlation that I see is hard work. I can't think of anything more than just effort and time put in, both for the student and the instructor or the parent. Okay, I'm going to put you in a spot here. What do you think about American students of today, this age, as compared to the 1960s and 70s and 80s in terms of hard work? Can you give us your perspective? <sighs> no, that's difficult. I've seen kids that have worked hard then and now. I think that's more an individual thing. I don't know that I would care to generalize on that. I will say, though, that there is so much more knowledge out there that a student that works hard has so much, so many more opportunities to acquire knowledge and to apply it that they, that the same amount of effort today you think will produce a much stronger chess player than back in the 60s. There just wasn't the number of games out there. They didn't have the tools to analyze them. Uh, they didn't have the, the number of, there's a plethora of chess books that didn't exist then. 
Uh, you just have more. When I was at Penn State playing with Donald Byrne was our coach, when we got a chance to see one of his games in his notebook, it was like a big thrill. Famous For, Donald Byrne. Yeah, yeah, today you could find games of any number of great players. They're just mm -hmm. more than you could ever utilize. So there's so much more knowledge out there that the same hardworking student of today can progress so much more quickly than they could. But Players let me, uh, um, not to interrupt, uh, the, the, the big question is, are students today able to develop at a more accurate and accelerated rate using a game model such as chess in today's world where digital information is so accessible and so immense? Do you see chess as a vehicle or framework where young children can learn how to use this information in a logical, structured way well, to enhance their life. Yeah, I definitely think they can learn to use it in a logical way, but is it different more? Does it provide more of an advantage in today's life than it did back in the 60s, being a great chess player? That's difficult to say because the world has changed a lot. We're into this rapid uh, acquisition of data, but then again, is this rapid acquisition of data and this number of video games that kids play, is that really encouraging deep thinking? I know that in some ways there, it requires greater reaction time and there's a lot of quicker, more hand-eye coordination, but that also it, speed is it's really hand-eye brain coordination because the video games aren't mindless. They, kids do learn to process things very, very quickly when they're playing video games. And that is a certain mental development that goes on. They analyze the correlation with, with brain hand-eye speed, and they found out that the ones that have the quickest reaction time were concert pianists. They could actually respond from the, the time of thought in the brain to their fingers. That mental concept was faster than with anything else. So early on, we kind of put down the role of video games, saying that it was just hand-eye, but it really isn't. It's hand-eye brain coordination, and I'm sure there's value in that. But on the other hand, does improving the speed of that and the efficiency of thinking, which that might do, does that at the expense of maybe more deep analytical thinking that, it, that chess provides? And that may not be. It may be that, that fewer kids are able to do that kind of deep thinking that are doing some of these other activities where everything is speeded up, you don't you see everything as at a quicker pace that we have now than, than we used to. It may be that that quickened pace that life presents us also deprives us of the time that it takes to analyze something more deeply. And it may be that some of the old-fashioned games that took longer to play, like chess, actually are providing that opportunity which means that kids may not be getting as many opportunities to do that deeper thinking now with the way things, the way society has changed as they used to. So maybe that thin chess is more valuable today in that it will provide that deep thinking activities which are not as common in today's society with today's youngsters as they used to be. Exactly. Welcome again, audience. Again, we're here with renowned chess instructor Steve Shutt here at the Masterman High School powerhouse of chess with 10 national championships under his belt. Mr. Shutt, yeah. Steve, thank you very much oh, for um, giving, granting pleasure. us this interview. It's been extremely enlightening and uh, we look forward to um, hopefully more interviews with you in the future as you continue to mount more championships here at Masterman High School. Well, we'll we'll see. I'm 71 now. I don't know how many more championships. How standing. I'm, I'm ready for, but uh, 70, 71 year old years young. You know, you have a lot of energy here, and and talking to some of your students, they're really enthused. They're very engaged, and you have a, a tremendous, tremendous program here. I understand you've retired. Yes, I retired recently. Last year was my last okay. full year of teaching. Yeah. So this year I'm, I'm in school working with the kids two days a week on a volunteer basis, mm -hmm. just but, with the chess program. But just like in The Godfather, I guess it was two or three when they say every time I try to leave, they drag me back in. They, they just can't let go of you here. And the result is another super national championship 
this past April 2013. Again, Mr. Shutt, Steve Shutt of Masterman High School, thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank Outstanding. you. Outstanding. All right. Good night, all. Yeah, that looks pretty good, too. So what happened was he took back. Right? Terrible. Then we played this move, threatening that. He yeah, takes, what if he takes, what if, what if and we happens? took here, hitting the queen and threatening that. And they go here. All right, now what do you, okay, don't touch the pieces now. If he plays a D, D8, what happens? Yeah. No, queen here. And no, king, that king takes. All right, so what happens after queen back to D8? Mm -hmm. check, I know, I know, I saw that. Check with the queen, okay? If he plays here, check. Check there. It's double check, right? When he queen. So the queen's lost no matter what you do. And so you win a queen, which is one step better, right? One step better than So when you find a good move, what do you do? Look for a better move. Just make that move. See you now.